die suffering at the hands of Rome because they believed in Christ alone they died to Europe especially Spain for they saw all but Christ is vain he suffered by his death for men to save them from their awful sin six hundred years of martyred saints that history cannot erase with iron heel and iron hand the Roman popes rule the land those ignorant of history may be swept into apostasy we won't be loved by Rome sweet lie with 50 million reasons why salvation is by faith alone in Christ alone by grace alone a sovereign God give faith to man salvation's in the maker's hand this gospel offends Rome today they offer up Another way, a counterfeit, a compromise Beware the ancient papal lie With such a cloud of witnesses Who by grace died in their Lord Recall their memory to say By the same faith we live today Good evening. Welcome to Walt's Mystery Babylon News Radio. My name's Tom Press, and I'll be guest hosting for the next hour, uh, rather the next two hours. The first hour, we will spend continuing our reading and discussion of this most magnificent Protestant work entitled Romanism and the Reformation uh, by Henry Grattan Guinness, and then we'll have an hour of fruitful discussion. We'll begin by retreating a paragraph or two for continuity purposes on page 239, just below the middle of the page. We're talking about how the Protestant reformers interpreted the prophecies of Daniel, Paul, and John regarding the little horn, the man of sin, the son of perdition, the Antichrist. And you will discover, as I have and others, that it is speaking of none other than the papacy of the Roman Catholic Church. Currently, we're talking about William Tyndale, known as the Morning Star of the Reformation. And we'll continue now with the reading. Speaking of William Tyndale, it says, in his exposition of the famous passage about Antichrist in the first epistle of John, William Tyndale says, quote, Though the bishop of Rome and his sects give Christ these names, and and he lists them, all rightful names of Christ, yet in that they rob him of the effect and take the signification of his names unto themselves and make of him, that is Christ, but a hypocrite, as they themselves be. They be the right Antichrist, and deny both the Father and the Son. For they deny the witness that the Father bore unto his Son, and deprive the Son of all the power and glory that his Father gave him. For whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. For no man knoweth the Father but the Son, and to whom the Son showeth him. Moreover, if thou know not the mercy that God hath showed thee in Christ, thou canst not know him as Father. Thou mayest well, apart from Christ, know him as a tyrant, and thou mayest know him by, the, by his works, as the old philosophers did, that there is a God, but thou canst neither believe in his mercy nor love his laws, which is the only worship in the Spirit, saved by Christ, unquote. So William Tyndale says that the Pope and his sects, or his bishops and cardinals and priests, 
while coming in the name of Christ, they deny Christ by assuming to themselves Christ or God's names and his deity and his power and his authority and virtually replace him. And they lead the whole world astray. By doing this, by taking upon themselves the attributes of God, they deny God, and this is Antichrist. Now, you can come to no other conclusion from these very words of of William Tyndale that he was a Protestant. He was Protestant before Protestantism even was known in the world. And we can trust that the Protestant Reformation was born on a solid foundation of Christ and Christ alone. The scriptures and scriptures alone and faith and faith alone and that the papacy was the fulfillment of the man of sin, the son of perdition, the little horn, the antichrist of the Bible. That's William Tyndale. Now we'll talk about other of the Protestant reformers. He says all the other English reformers, including Latimer, Ridley, Cranmer, Bradford, and Jewell, held that the Pope of Rome was the man of sin. So did John Knox of Scotland, and he sounded out his testimony on this subject as with a trumpet. Here is an old copy of Knox's History of the Reformation. Its contents are thus described on the title page. Quote, The manner and by what persons the light of Christ's gospel has been manifested into this realm after that horrible and universal defection from the truth, which has come by the means of the Roman Antichrist, unquote. The Roman Antichrist, the papacy. Now, Knox begins his history by giving a list of the articles of faith attributed to the Lollards of Kyle. The Lollards, many of you have heard of the Lollards, and if you haven't, they were a sect of Protestants, early Protestants. And it was taken from the Register of Glasgow. Of these, the 32nd article runs this way, quote, the Pope is the head of the Church of Antichrist, unquote. That's right. The Pope is the Antichrist, and the Roman Catholic Church is the Church of Antichrist. Now, after describing the affecting martyrdom of Patrick Hamilton, whose dying words were, quote, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. How long shall darkness overwhelm this realm? How long wilt thou suffer this tyranny of men? Unquote. He tells how he himself was led to undertake the public preaching of God's word. In the year 1547, John Knox, wearied of removing from place to place by reason of persecution, came to the castle of St. Andrews, resolved to leave Scotland for Germany. Here he took the part of a godly preacher named John Ruff against Dean Annan, a Romanist. Knox wielded his pen with such effect that Annan was beaten from all his defenses and was compelled to take shelter under the authority of the church, which authority, he said, quote, damned all Lutherans and heretics, and therefore he needed no further disputation, unquote. Obviously, his church was the Roman Catholic Church, and it damns all Lutherans and heretics, or better known as Protestants. And therefore, because his church damned all Protestants, he had no more purpose in disputing with them. So you can see what this man thought of Protestantism, and also what he thought of his church, the Church of Antichrist. Now he says, to this, Knox answered... Quote, before we hold ourselves, or that you can prove us sufficiently convinced, we must define the church by the right notes given to us in God's scripture of the true church. 
We must discern the immaculate spouse of Jesus Christ from the mother of confusion, spiritual Babylon, lest that impudently we embrace a harlot instead of the chaste spouse, yea, to speak in plain words, lest that we submit ourselves to Satan, thinking we submit ourselves to Jesus Christ. For, as for your Roman Catholic Church, as it is now corrupted, I no more doubt that it is the synagogue of Satan and the head thereof called the Pope to be the man of sin of whom the apostle speaketh, than that I doubt that Jesus Christ suffered by the procurement of the visible church uh, of the visible church of Jerusalem. Yea, I offer myself by word or writing to prove the Roman Catholic Church this day further degenerate from the purity which was in the days of the apostles than was the church of the Jews from the ordinances given by Moses when they consented to the innocent death of Jesus Christ, unquote. Knox tells us that these words were, quote, spoken in the open audience of the parish church of St. Andrews, unquote, after Dean Annan's delivery. The people hearing the offer urged Knox to lay his proofs before them in a public speech, saying that if Knox was right, they had been miserably deceived. This kind of sounds like Christians today, right? Miserably deceived. Yes, they no more know that the Roman Catholic Church is the synagogue of Satan than did the Roman Catholics of Knox's day. Amazing the situation that exists in this country and around the world in Protestantism that no longer knows who the Antichrist is. It's inconceivable blindness. John Knox consented and was appointed to preach the following Sunday. On that day, he tells us, he preached his first sermon, taking his text from the seventh chapter of Daniel, Daniel chapter 7. He gives us, listen carefully, he gives us an outline of its contents. It opened with a short discourse on the four empires, the Babylonian, the Persian, the Grecian, and the Roman, as set forth by the four wild beasts of the seventh chapter of Daniel and then showed that the persecuting little horn of the fourth empire was identical with the man of sin and the Antichrist and signified the Roman papacy. For this sermon, John Knox was called to account before a convention of, quote, gray friars and black fiends, as he called them. Nine articles were laid, were laid against him, nine charges nine criminal charges were laid against him. Of these, the first was that he had taught that, quote, no mortal man can be head of the church, unquote. So who do you suppose he was talking about? Why, the, the papacy, of course, who claims to be the head of all the churches. He says, quote, no mortal man can be head of the church, unquote. And the second, that, quote, the Pope is an Antichrist, and so is no member of Christ's mystical body, unquote. Now, what does the Pope teach? That the papacy is the head of the mystical body of Christ. So he directly contradicted the canonical teaching of the Roman Catholic Church with regard to the papacy and what role the papacy and the Roman Catholic Church play in history and in prophecy. <clears throat> now, he says, Knox gives us an account of his argument with the friars on this occasion in which he evidently had the best of it. In other words, he whipped them like a dog. He won the debate. He says, thus was launched the Protestant Reformation in Scotland, and Knox's sermon at St. Andrew's on the little horn of prophecy struck its keynote and started its testimony. The Protestant Reformation had come to Scotland through John Knox, who, 
protested the papacy as the Antichrist, protested the Roman Catholic Church as the synagogue of Satan, and preached faith and faith alone, grace and grace alone, the scriptures and scripture alone in Christ and Christ alone. No human head of the church. Now, the English reformers were no less clear in their views and emphatic in their teachings. Ridley thus expresses himself, quote, The see of Rome is the seat of Satan, and the bishop of the same, that is the papacy, that maintaineth the abominations thereof, that is the mass and all these sacraments, is Antichrist himself indeed. And for the same causes, this sea at this day is the same that St. John, the prophet John, calls in his revelation, the book of Revelation, Babylon, or the whore of Babylon, and spiritual Sodom and Egypt, the mother of fornications and abominations upon the earth. Unquote. Do you see the unanimity among the Protestant reformers? Every single one, to the very last man of them, agreed about the papacy and the Roman Catholic Church. Now, why are we in a quandary today as to who the Antichrist is? You must comprehend right along with me that that ambivalence, that controversy, could only come as a result of a huge... Now, Latimer, beginning on the top of page 244, if you're reading along with me, Latimer, another English reformer, when examined by the commissioners on his trial, said, quote, I confess there is a Catholic Church. Now, let me explain before I even continue what Latimer is saying. Many Bible-believing Christians use the word Catholic to describe the universal church of Jesus Christ. And they made a distinction between the Catholic Church or the Church of Jesus Christ and the Roman Catholic Church was a counterfeit. Now, for those who are unfamiliar with that usage, you might become a bit confused about what Catholic Church he's talking about. I never intend to confuse my listeners. I never use the word Catholic or universal to describe the true body of Christ. I leave those to Rome. Roman Catholicism, Catholic, or the universal church, when I'm speaking, refer to Rome and only Rome. I never mix the holy with the profane. But early church, early church fathers did on occasion refer to the, the, the true body of Christ as the Catholic church. That is factual. And I cannot deny that, but I do not use that convention. But with that understanding, maybe you can understand now what Latimer is saying. He says, quote, I confess there is a Catholic church to the detriment of which I stand. That is the universal church of Jesus Christ, the true church, quote, but not the church which you call Catholic, which sooner might be called diabolic, unquote. Now, let me read his quote again without interjection, just as it's written in the book. Quote, I confess there is a Catholic church to the detriment of which I stand, but not the church which you call Catholic, which sooner might be called diabolic, unquote. In his second reference with Ridley, he says, quote, Yea, what fellowship hath Christ with Antichrist? Therefore, it is not lawful to bear the yoke with papists. Quote, 
Come forth from among them and be separate, separate yourselves from them, saith the Lord, unquote. Yes, we are not to be unequally yoked with unbelievers, and this author, this Protestant reformer, Ridley, regarded papists as unbelievers, and that's exactly what they are. They believe in, in a false Christ. That makes them unbelievers. Now, Bishop Jewell, another Protestant reformer of England, wrote a most masterful and powerful commentary on Thessalonians, proving the Pope of Rome to be the man of sin. Here's a copy of it. Here's good old Grattan Guinness holding up another book. You must know he brought a whole wagon load of, bro- of, of books to prove every point that he made. He says, take as a specimen the following sentences about Antichrist. Quote, now listen carefully to this and compare what is written here about Antichrist with what is believed in the churches today, and you'll be startled as I was when I first read this. He says, take as a specimen following sentences about Antichrist. Quote, Some say that he should be a Jew of the tribe of Dan. Some that he should be born in Babylon. Some that Muhammad is Antichrist. Some that Nero was Antichrist. Some that he should be born of a friar and a nun. Some that he should continue but three and a half years. Some that he should turn trees upside down with the tops to the ground and should force the roots to grow upwards and then should flee up into heaven and fall down and break his neck. These tales have been craftily devised to beguile your eyes that whilst we think upon these guesses and so occupy ourselves in beholding a shadow or probably conjecture of Antichrist, he which is Antichrist indeed may unawares deceive us. Do you hear what he's saying? He's saying they're putting out, in order to cloak the fact, the biblical, historical, and prophetic fact that the papacy is the Antichrist, they put out every conjecture one can imagine about who the Antichrist will be, and these are what are taught in the churches today. Let me read them again. Some say that Antichrist will be a Jew of the tribe of Dan. Some that he should be born in Babylon. Some that Mohammed is the Antichrist. Some that Nero was the Antichrist. There's your preterism for you. Some that he should be born of a friar and a nun, and some that he should continue for three and the, uh, three years and a half. Is that not the mid-tribbers? The overwhelming majority of Bible-professing people in the world today believe that Antichrist will come either seven or three and one-half years before Christ's literal return. There's futurism spoken of right there. It was the teaching of the Roman Catholic Church, just as was preterism. You can believe in you want. They don't care which lie you believe. They'll give you as many options to, to believe about Antichrist as there are stars in the heavens. Take your pick. You're damned if you believe every single, in any one of them, but you only come to the truth, the biblical, historical, and prophetic truth, if you believe as did the Protestant reformers, as the Lawlards, as the Hussites, as the Albigensians, the Waldensians, the, the apostolic Christians, that the papacy, and only the papacy, is the prophesied Antichrist to come and deceive, deceive the whole world. That is Protestantism. And if you believe anything other than that, you cannot rightly describe yourself as a Protestant. And I'm sorry to say there is almost no Protestantism left in this country. Amazing, isn't it? 
that Satan could so, could have so deceived God's true people that they would forget that the papacy is the Antichrist in the Bible. Now, quote, he will come in the name of Christ. So now, this, listen, this is what Antichrist is prophesied to be. He will come in the name of Christ, yet will he do all things against Christ and under pretense and color of serving Christ. Is that not the papacy? He shall devour the sheep and people of Christ. Is that not the papacy? He shall deface whatsoever Christ hath taught. Is that not the papacy? He shall quench that fire which Christ kindled. Again, cannot be denied, this is the papacy. Those plants which Christ hath planted, he shall root up. There's your inquisitions, your crusades, and all the martyrs of Jesus right there. Those plants which Christ planted, the wheat, he shall root up. He shall undermine that house which Christ hath built. He shall be contrary to Christ, his faith contrary to the faith of Christ, and his life contrary to the life of Christ. Christ was humble and lowly. The prophet in his own person speaks of him in Psalms chapter 22, quote, I am a worm and not a man, a shame of men and the contempt of the people, unquote. And the apostle saith in Philippians chapter 2, quote, He humbleth himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross, unquote. Behold his parents, his birth, his cradle. Behold his life his disciples, his doctrine, and his death. All were witnesses unto his humility. He said of himself, he said of himself, quote, the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head, unquote. And to his disciples he saith, quote, the kings of the Gentiles reign over them, and they that bear rule over them are called gracious lords. Be ye not, uh, uh, but ye, excuse me, but ye shall not be so, unquote. And again, he says, learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls, unquote. Now, on the other part, take view of Antichrist. Behold his birth, his place his chair, his estate, his doctrine, his disciples, and all his life you shall see nothing but pomp and glory. Gregory calls him the king of pride. He is proud in life, proud in doctrine, proud in word, and proud in deeds. He is like Lucifer, and sets himself before his brethren and over nations and kingdoms. He makes every knee to bow to him and worship him. He makes kings to bring him water, to carry his train, to hold his cup and to bear his dish, to lead his bridle and to hold his stirrup. He claims power over heaven and earth. He saith, he is Lord over all the world, the Lord of lords and the King of kings, that his authority reaches up into heaven and down into hell, that he can command the angels of God, that he condemns who he will condemn, and that he makes saints at his pleasure, that whosoever he blesses is blessed, and that whosoever he curses is cursed. He sells merits, that's right, indulgences, the forgiveness of sins, 
The sacrifice for the quick and the dead. Did you know the mass is said to be a sacrifice? The same sacrifice of Christ on the cross and that it is good for the redemption of the living and the dead. In other words, that through the saying of the Mass, you may be saved, though you've been in the grave a million years. So saith the uh, pre, uh, the uh, evolutionists. That's what the Mass is. It's the greatest abomination, the greatest counterfeit, the most believed malarkey there has ever been on the face of the earth. And the papacy presides over that instrument, the mass. He sells merits, the sins, the sacrifice for the quick and the dead, that is, the living and the dead. He makes merchandise of the souls of men, as it says at the end of chapter 18 of the book of Revelation, He lays filthy hands upon the Lord's anointed, that is, the saints, the true saints of Jesus Christ. This is what's important for us in this modern day of quote-unquote regime changes and quote-unquote national and international sanctions. Listen carefully. He removes kings and deposes the states and princes of the world. That's right. He uproots kings and kingdoms. He redraws the boundaries of states. And that goes on right before our faces on a daily basis, and no one even considers that the papacy has any role in it. He removes kings and deposes the states and princes of the world. That's right. He declares himself king of kings and lord of lords. He divides up the land as he sees fit, just like God divided up the land for Israel. He takes the place of Christ. He denies Christ by taking his place and acting like him and charging that the whole world must believe and obey him. This is Antichrist, says the, the, the author. This is Antichrist. This is his power. And we see it every day. But nobody calls it what it is. And those who know, most of which have no, no gumption to inform anyone else. It continues, he says, so shall he sit in the temple of God. The people shall wonder at him and shall have him in reverence. They shall say, who is like unto the beast? Who is so wise, so mighty, so godly, so virtuous, so holy, and so like unto God? So intolerable and monstrous shall be his pride, unquote. Listen now to the dying testimony upon this subject of the well-known reformer, Archbishop Cranmer. Let me read you the words he spoke just before his martyrdom. Yes, he was burned at the stake for denouncing the papacy as antichrist. Here's what he said, quote, For as much as I am come to the last end of my life, whereupon all hangeth of my life and past end of my life to come, either to live with my master Jesus Christ forever in joy, or else to be in pain forever with wicked devils in hells, and I see before mine eyes presently either heaven ready to receive me or else hell ready to swallow me up. I shall therefore I shall therefore declare unto you my very faith, how I believe, without any color or dissimulation. In other words, I'm going to tell you in plain speech how I believe. 
for now it is no time to dissemble whatsoever I have said or written in the past, unquote. Having briefly expressed the chief articles of his faith, he refers to his previous recantation in the following terms. That's right. What he grieved the most at his death was that he recanted his Protestant beliefs about the papacy. Now out to burn at the stake, and he's going to renounce, uh, re, uh, he's going to uh, repudiate his own renunciation. Here's what he says. Having briefly expressed the chief articles of his faith, he refers to his previous recantation in the following terms. Quote, and now I come to the great thing that so much troubleth my, my conscience more than anything I ever did or said in my whole life. And that is the setting abroad of a writing contrary to the truth, which now here I renounce and refuse as things written with my hand contrary to the truth, which I thought in my heart and which was written for, de- <clears throat> for fear of death and to save my life if it might be. And that is all such bills and papers which I've written or signed with my hand since my degradation wherein I have written many things untrue. And forasmuch as my hand offended, writing contrary to my heart, my hand shall be first to be punished, therefore. For may I come to the fire, I shall first be burned, or rather it, my right hand, shall first be burned. And as for the Pope, I refuse him as Christ's enemy. And Antichrist with all his false doctrines, unquote. Those were the very last words spoken by Cranmer before he was burned in the flames. I refuse, as, as for the Pope, I refuse him as Antichrist. All right? He called him Christ's enemy. And that's what he is. And you'll ne- you, you would never hear it in a single church called Christian in this country. On uttering this, Cranmer was pulled down from the stage and led to the fire. Having put off his outer garments, he stood there in a shirt which hung down to his feet. His beard was long and thick and covered his bosom. Then was an iron chain tied about him, and the fire set to the faggots. When these were kindled and the fire began to burn near him, stretching out his arm, he put his right hand into the flame, holding it there immovable. Thus did he stand, moving no more than the stake to which he was bound. His eyes were lifted to heaven, and often he repeated, quote, This hand hath offended. Oh, this unworthy right hand. Unquote. At last, in the greatness of the flame, he cried, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit, and gave up the ghost. Antichrist, which now by the will of God doth rage for the trial of our faith, doth nothing else but procure us a ready horse to bring us to heaven, unquote. So said the holy man, John Bradford, another Protestant. John Bradford, quote, Brother Bradford, as Ridley called him, and he too was burned. When led to the stake, he took a faggot in his hand and kissed it. That a faggot is a bundle of kindling. And they gathered sticks and straw and whatever would light rather quickly and bound them all up and cast them at the base of the stake so that when the executioner came around with a torch, they would easily ignite and consume the body. It says, when led to the stake, he took a faggot in his hand and kissed it, rejoicing to suffer death in the cause of Christ. Standing then by the stake and with both hands uplifted, he cried, quote, O England, England, repent thee of thy sins. Repent thee of thy sins. 
Beware of idolatry. Beware of the false antichrists. Take heed they do not deceive thee, unquote. Cranmer, Ridley, Latimer, and Bradford were burned for their testimony against the papal antichrist, just as were Huss and Jerome and Cobham had done before. Thousands of martyrdoms have sealed this testimony, and on this testimony rests the Protestant Reformation. To reject this testimony is to reject the foundation of that work. It is to reject the foundation of the noblest and divinest work which has been wrought in this world since the day of Pentecost. The Protestant Reformation was the greatest work of God since the day of Pentecost. And it has been almost completely forgotten and repudiated. And God forbid the churches have all, nearly all, signed documents of capitulation to the papacy. They say the protest is over. They say we must now unite all of Christianity against this Muslim horde. They're doing it to save their own lives, yet they're giving up their life. That's the truth. Ecumenism, the unification, spiritual or otherwise, with the Roman Catholic Church is spiritual suicide. You can't claim Jesus Christ out of your mouth and then serve the Antichrist, the Pope of Rome, with your hands and your feet. You cannot serve two masters, for you will love the one and despise the other. There is but one King of Kings and Lord of Lords. The other is a usurper and a liar and the vicar of Satan himself. Now, continuing on to page 250, he says, Do not misunderstand me. I do not say that the teachings of Scripture uh, scripture prophecy form the sole foundation of the Reformation. The doctrinal and practical truths of Scripture guided the action of the Reformers as well as the prophetic. They opposed the Church of Rome as condemned alike by the doctrines, the precepts, and the prophecies of the Word of God. It might be difficult to say which of the three weighed with them the most. On each, they were clear and emphatic. These three elements cannot be separated in estimating the springs of the Protestant Reformation. From the first and throughout, that movement was energized and guided by the prophetic word. Luther never felt strong and free to war against the papal apostasy until he recognized the Pope as the Antichrist. It was then he burned the papal bull. John Knox's first sermon, the sermon which launched him on his mission as a Protestant reformer, was on the prophecies concerning the the papacy. The reformers embodied their interpretations of prophecy in their confessions of faith and Calvin in his institutes. All the reformers, all the reformers were unanimous in the matter. Even the mild and cautious Melanchthon was as assured of the anti-papal meaning of these prophecies as was Martin Luther himself. And their interpretation of these prophecies determined their reforming action. It led them to protest against Rome with extraordinary strength and undaunted courage. It nerved them to resist the claims of that apostate church to the uttermost. It made them martyrs. It sustained them at the stake. And the views of the Protestant reformers were shared by thousands, by hundreds of thousands, 
They were adopted by princes and peoples. Under their influence, nations abjured their allegiance to the false priests of Rome. In the reaction which followed, all the powers of hell seemed to be let loose upon the adherence to the Protestant Reformation. War followed war. Tortures, burnings, and massacres were multiplied. Yet, the Protestant Reformation stood undefeated and unconquerable. God's word upheld it and the energies of the Almighty Spirit. It was the work of Jesus Christ as truly as the founding of the church 18 centuries ago and the revelation of the future which he gave from heaven, that prophetic book with which the scripture closes, was one of the mightiest instruments employed in its accomplishment. To resist the use to which the scripture prophecy was put by the reformers is no light or important matter, unimportant matter. The system of prophetic interpretation known as futurism does resist this use. Here, for the first time, Henry Grattan Guinness uses the term futurism to describe the fallacy, the Jesuit-inspired fallacy that has single-handedly overthrown the belief of the, unana- the unanimous Protestant reformers that saw the papacy all throughout its history as being the fulfillment of the little horn, the man of sin, the son of perdition, and the biblical, historical, and prophetic antichrist. And here it is, futurism resists this interpretation of the prophecy. Full well, the Jesuits foisted futurism against the Protestant Reformation. And the Protestants took the bait, hook, line, and sinker, swallowed it down deep until the hook is engaged into their bowels and they can no longer spit it out. And now they're being reeled in reeled in to the bark of Peter to be food for the papacy, and that's just exactly what they, the papacy intends to do with them. Eat them alive spiritually. To resist the use to which Scripture prophecy was put by the Reformers is no light and unimportant matter. The system of prophetic interpretation known as futurism does resist this use. It condemns the interpretation of the reformers. It condemns the views of all these men and of the martyrs and of all the confessors and faithful witnesses of Christ for long centuries. How long? At least 1,500 years. Futurism overturns the beliefs of all Bible-believing Christians from the time of Christ to the current day and age. Futurism is straight from the pit of hell itself. Futurism condemns the Albigensians and the Waldensians and the Wycliffites and the Hussites and the Lawlers and the Lutherans and the Calvinists and all them that believed the word of God and saw in the Bible the prophecies of Paul, Daniel, or Daniel and John as the fulfillment in the papacy. The Albigenses believed the Pope was the Antichrist. The Waldenses believed the, the Pope was the Antichrist. The Wycliffites, the Hussites, the Lawlers, the Lutherans, the Calvinists, they all believed the same thing, that the papacy is, was, and always will be the Antichrist of Scripture. God was not duplicitous with his people. God did not try to deceive his people. History confirms that God was telling the truth that Daniel was telling the truth, that Paul was telling the truth, that John was telling the truth. How is it that the Christians of today have abandoned the truth? Few 
futurism condemns the Albigenses, the Waldens, the Wycliffites, the Hussites, the Lollards, the Lutherans, the Calvinists. It condemns them all and upon a point upon which they all agreed. An interpretation of Scripture which they embodied in their solemn confessions and sealed with their blood. It condemns the spring of their action, the foundation of the structure they erected. How daring is this act, and how destitute of justification. I say again, how daring is this act, and how destitute of justification. What an opposition to the pillars of a work most manifestly divine. For it is no less than this. For futurism asserts that Martin Luther and all the reformers were wrong in this fundamental point. And whose interpretation of prophecy does it justify and approve? That of the Romanists. Let this be clearly seen. Rome felt the force of these prophecies and sought to evade it. It had no way but to deny their applicability to the papacy. It could not deny their existence in Scripture. They were there plainly enough, but it denied that these prophecies referred to the Romish church and its head. It pushed them aside. It shifted them from the entire field of medieval and modern history. That's right. They wiped it out. They wiped out the Protestant belief from modern history. That's why nobody knows what the Protestant Reformation was about these days. The Romanists wiped out the history of the Protestant Reformation in the schools and the churches and the colleges and every educational institution in this country. How in God's name did the Romanists wipe out the history of the Protestant Reformation? You have to ask yourself, how much cooperation and from whom did the papacy remove from our entire education system in this country any knowledge about the Protestant Reformation and what they believed? You have to ask yourself, and how much can you trust any of those institutions today that thought it beneficial, that thought it proper to hide Rome's atrocities and to also hide God's hand of reformation in his body? What deception we are under today. It's not so much the lies they teach, the lies they tell. It's the truth they've hidden from us. It says they were plainly enough, but it denied that these prophecies referred to the Romish church and its head. It pushed them aside it shifted them from the entire field of medieval and modern history. As to Babylon the Great, it asserted that it meant Rome pagan, not Rome papal. Rome pagan shed all the blood, referred to in Revelation chapter 17 and 18, according to these people. Rome Christian had shed none of it, Right? You see the lies and the liars? They just push all of the abominations found in the book of Revelation onto pagan Rome before the Holy Roman Empire, before the Antichrist came to power. They blame pagan Rome, which never professed to be Christian. And they get by with that absurdity. He said Rome Christian had shed none of it. 
No, Roman Christian, the Roman Catholic Church has never shed the blood of the saints, according to Rome, and according to the Protestants, now called ecumenical. Now, they want to forget all that history. They just want to get on about the the business of making bacon with the whore of Rome. That's what they're all about. Ecumenical evangelic bellies repudiate the name of Jesus Christ every time they open their Bible and every time they open a church door and every time they open their mouths. They preach futurism. That's their great salvation that the Antichrist won't come until the last seven years before Christ's return. And in the meantime, they're under grace. They can sin all their heart's content. They can even reunite with the Roman Catholic Church, and it's all forgiven. You never saw such deception and depravity, spiritual blindness in all your Christian life until you come to the reality that we're all born, bred, and raised it from cradle to grave. We've never heard the truth, and it's time for us to put away this childishness and become men and stand up for Christ, stand up for the Protestant Reformation, and stand up against the Antichrist of Rome. I'm going to conclude right here, the top of page 253, and I hope I can get my voice back so I can continue next Sunday in the reading and discussion of this most important Protestant work entitled Romanism and the Reformation from the Standpoint of Prophecy. We must start at the foot of the cross. For our souls in danger, we're at loss. And when we kneel in that awesome place, at that very moment, you'll feel God's grace. Friend, let me tell you, you need to know, there is heaven, also hell below. Christ died on that cross to set you free from your vile sins and hell's agony. You're God's enemy without the cross. Reject Christ and to God your dross. Prison of hell he will send, just Christ's work on the cross makes amends. God hates those who try to enter in, the gates of heaven still full of sin. Only his son can take sin away, go to the foot of the cross this day. God has provided only one way to enter heaven's wondrous array. Except what Jesus did for us all, he paid our debt, so hell won't befall. Go to the foot of the cross this day, his precious blood washes sin away. We each need to think more of his cross, without our Savior we're total loss.